Thank you very, very, very much. It is awesome to be here. I love coming here. You are just my favorite people in the world to worship with. You know how to sing. I don't, but I love singing with you because I feel like I know how to sing. Uh, it's just great to come and worship with you. I've got my three children here today, and uh, I visit a lot. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Do you see that? Three people started that, and then everybody kind of joined in. That's pretty cool, huh? Yeah, no, it's great to be here. We go to all kinds of different churches and all kinds of places, and uh, you are just one of our favorites, absolutely one of our favorites. So thanks for welcoming. I know, I know a lot of you now, and I can't wait to get to know more of you. So it's just a privilege to be here, and your pastor has just become like a great friend of mine. I say this, like, when I get to heaven, I want to be Pastor Felix. That's, that's how cool I think he is. And so I just, I'm honored to be speaking in his place, and he's speaking in my place, and it's really great to be with you. I'm going to be in Luke chapter 10 this morning. I'm going to have a chance to talk about a story that happened in the ministry of Jesus that has had profound impact on my life. So if you've got like a Bible, a phone, an iPad, or however it is that you, you read, I'd love for you to read along. I think they're going to have some words on the screen to, to read along with, and I'd love to just teach from... Uh, from Luke chapter 10. It's a story that if you've been to church more than a half dozen times, you've maybe heard the story of Mary and Martha and the fight they had. I want to walk back through it because it's like <sighs> kind of familiar in my life. I don't, I don't know that I want to admit that a lot, but, but the truth is this, this is kind of familiar. So Luke chapter 10, we're going to read verse 38 through 42, and we're going to, we're going to look at this conflict that I think occurs internally and externally in our lives, and just kind of talk through uh, this particular story. So Luke 10, 38 through 42. Man, if you can't find it or, or you didn't bring something, that's fine. I'm just going to read it, and we're, and we're, and we're going to walk through it together. It starts this way. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but only one thing is needed. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. I have read this since I was a child. I've heard teachers teach on this, but it was only a few years ago that I started hearing some really wise counsel on this text that, that really changed my life, I'll be honest with you. Dr. Ortberg and others started to teach more deeply about this passage, and it's become real personal for me. You, let, let me explain. You see, usually when I hear this taught, or when I had taught it, it was a teaching about the difference between two kinds of people. There, the, the, and, and one was always considered better than the other. And we're good in our world, right, of dividing people into two kinds of people, we, we have that. There's rich folk and poor folk and Republicans and Democrats and people who grew up watching Dukes of Hazard and people who grew up playing Sanford and Sons. I don't know if you know what I mean, but you know, the two kinds of people, right? There's people who like to get up early in the morning and people who don't like people who like to get up early in the morning, right? There's, I don't know, there's uh, people who love cats and then there's people who are smart, right? There's just, there's two, yeah, you know what I, stay with me, you know what I mean, we, we, we divide this up into, this world into two kinds of people, and it's us and them, and it's this and that, and this is the way this passage is usually taught, there's like a, a Martha type, and if you're here today and you're a Martha type, you're like the queen of, king of multitasking, you like to do lots of things at once, keep multiple plates spinning, and you like to help other people do lots of things at once, like Already this morning, you've worshipped authentically and done your shopping list and four or five other things right as the service was going on. This is you. This is how you live life. And the people around you know what I mean because they're looking at you right now like, yeah, we're, I'm married to a Martha, right? Just keeps it going all the time. But, but if you're a married type, you like the quieter life, 
the more contemplative life, the sweeter life. You like to think more deeply, and you like, well, frankly, if you're the Mary type, and you heard me read this passage, you, in your sweet, contemplative way, had a sigh of relief, because you're sitting next to a Martha type, and you thought, today, Martha gets hers, right? <laughs> you didn't say it out loud, yeah, Martha's the bad. But there's a problem with that understanding. The problem with that understanding of this story is that the Martha types are praised so much in Scripture. Work now while it's day, Jesus says, for the night is coming. There's, there's, there's this talk of bearing fruit with our life and achievement and work and effort are good things. So there's a, there's a problem with that understanding. What I'd like to do is read back through that same passage with you verse by verse, and comment on some things that maybe, maybe will be new to you about what's going on in this text. So can you read this again with me? You know what? Before that, I want to pray. Father in heaven, help us now to read this with ears that hear, with hearts that understand. Help us now to truly dig into your word and learn and think and be changed by you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. I gotta stop there. You might miss this. In Jesus' day, it would be scandalous for a woman to own a home. That never happened. Women were not supposed to own homes in Jesus' culture in his day. This would be, if you're reading it in Jesus' day, like, what? you got to be kidding. It would have been so known in the community that the community of Bethany, where this is occurring, would be known as the community where a woman owned a home. That would be super unusual. Super unusual. Oh, not only that, did you notice here, it says where a woman named Martha. Martha means mistress of the home. Her parents, no, names are a big deal in Jesus' time. Like you named a person and yet that defined their character. It's who as parents you wanted them to be. It was a really big deal. In our day, not so much. We just want it to sound cool sometimes. But in Jesus' day, right, big deal. Big deal. And her parents named her mistress of the home and, and handed this home off to her, most likely. And this is what she became known for. Like, if you went by Martha's house, the garden was spectacular, right? Yeah, that's Martha's house. Look at those roses. Holy cow. She does yard work like nobody else does. I mean, she was known for this. And, and when she hosted a gathering, it was the best. Like, nobody in Bethany could host the evening at a home like Martha. This is what her, her whole identity is wrapped up in this. It's what she's famous for. Know who Martha is, right? This is who she is. She owns a house, and she does it really, really, really well. Okay. Then it says, she had a sister called Mary. So apparently living with her is her sister Mary. This is good news because earlier in this verse, it talks about the fact that Jesus is dropping by. This is before, think through this. This is before McDonald's, Motel 6, or anything they're like. And this is before you could send a text or a tweet or anything letting people know you were dropping by. Maybe there were carrier pigeons, but that's about all the notice Jesus could give. So Jesus and his gang of somewhere between 18 and 25 people, usually the amount of people that traveled with Jesus, his closest disciples, at least 18 people and Jesus, who by the way is now a famous rabbi, shows up at your house unannounced with 18 people. There's a heavy expectation 
about food and lodging because that's how you did it in those days. And your name is Martha. You're famous for these kind of things. You're famous for pulling this off. This is going to be in the Bible someday. Holy cow, I better have a great meal and this better work out great, right? Because nobody else is going to talk about Martha any other time. This is the night of my life. Do you understand the setting now? Knock, knock, door opens. <gasps> Shoot, Jesus, happy to have you. You've been there? This is what's going on. This is the pressure. Martha's sweating a little bit. Okay. Then it says, though, she had a sister called Mary, and there's a little bit of, okay, at least he's got help. You with me? At least he's got help. But watch what it says next. It says, who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. Now here's what this means. It doesn't mean though Jesus comes in, he's sitting on the couch or sitting in the barco lounger or wherever, and he's teaching. This doesn't mean as he's sitting there that Mary's literally on the floor at his feet. When the Bible says somebody is sitting at their feet, it means they've made a conscious decision to be somebody else's disciple. Paul, for instance, sat at somebody's feet. It made, it made a decision to be a disciple and that the rabbi allowed that to happen. Now, let me tell you this. If you're reading this in Jesus' day, this would be scandalous even more than what we talked about before. No self-respecting rabbi ever allowed a woman to be their disciple. Never happened. Matter of fact, the rabbis would talk that if they were really spiritual, they, they would not even look more than a couple seconds at a woman's face. That meant to be really spiritual as a rabbi. And Martha looks out into the living room when she's panicking, trying to get the green beans started. And her sister is sitting right in there with all the guys, soaking up Jesus' teaching. That is, Martha's thinking, you got to be kidding. This is inappropriate. Her place is in the kitchen. Get back in here, right? Come on. She's mad. She's distracted. Her life's on the line here. And Mary is just sitting there in the living room. There's something wrong about that, Martha's thinking, okay? You with me? Do you understand what's going on here? You feeling Martha just a little bit? It says, Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. That's like a bit of an understatement, right? Ah, uh, let me see if I can put this in modern times. I, I, okay, I'm going to share like what might be an analogy to what's going on here with what may or may not have ever happened in my house. I don't cop to this. I'm just saying, let's just say in some of our houses, it's Sunday afternoon. You with me? Sunday afternoon. And let's say there's a football game on on this particular Sunday afternoon. Let's say the Broncos are playing because Christians are Broncos fans. So let's just say, <laughs> stay with me. Stay with me. And let's say there's two people in the house. Two people in the house. The Broncos are on. You got the setting. You with me? May or may not have ever happened in my house. Just maybe somebody's house. Let's say one of you is laying on the couch watching the game. Let's just say. I don't know who that would be in my family. Let's just say, though. Let's say the other person is in the kitchen preparing lunch. And let's just say the person in the kitchen preparing lunch is a little frustrated with the person on the couch. Let's just say. Let's just say. Have it, it, what I've heard about these situations is that as that frustration rises, noise starts to come from the kitchen. Yeah, you've been there. I, I've just heard about it, but let's just say. Uh, cabinets start to get slammed a little. Yeah. <laughs> and, 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 and mutterings, speaking in other languages starts to kind of happen. You, you've been there, you just, stuff starts to go on. And, 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 and when you're in that situation, what I've heard is that the person on the couch watching the game has to do what at that point? You've got to turn the volume up. 
That's right. You got to turn the volume up because you can't hear. They're making so much noise, right? It's like the amplification. From, and the noise on both ends just keeps going up. You, you've been there? Yeah, I've been there. Uh, so, so, yeah. Yeah, I think that's what's going on here in the home of Mary and Martha. I think, I think Mary is sitting there trying to listen. Jesus keeps having to raise his voice. And Martha keeps adding to the noise. Hint, hint. Like she walks by the hallway to the living room and gives a good stare at Mary. You're not Mary, but just gives a good stare. Come on. Right? Got stuff going on. And Martha's just oblivious to it all. Right? And I think pots and pans and stuff is happening in the kitchen. And then Martha takes action. Martha's a person of action. She's going to fix this. This isn't right. This is not where Mary belongs. It says she came to him. She's, she's going to skip right over Mary. She's given up on Mary. Right? You know, if you've had a sister or a brother, you, 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 you know. It says she came to him. She's going to go right to the one who talks about serving all the time. With me? This is what she's thinking. I'm going to go right to the one who says, you know, wash the feet, least is the best, service, all this. Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by who? myself. Come on. This isn't fair. This isn't right. Don't you care? She's just sitting there. It's about me. Hmm. Uh-oh. Tell her, get her in line. Tell her to help me. Have, have you ever prayed that God would fix somebody? Yeah. 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 You've ever said, they need you. Fix them. I'm doing what's right here. Fix them. Be careful when you pray like that. Okay? Because here's what's next. Martha, Martha. Whenever Jesus says your name twice. <laughs> might not be good, right? Might not be good, right? Martha. I mean, I think it's more than that. I think Jesus here is emphasizing for Martha, like, I know your name. I know your whole identity is wrapped up in this evening. Like, you live your life so other people will think highly of how you do house, because I know it's a big deal. And you're all wrapped up in that, Martha. Martha, mistress of the house. Mistress of the house. It's what you've become about. And you got all kind of stuff going on. He goes on to say, he says, you're worried and upset about many things. Martha, I can see right through you. And I see the way you live. I see the heavy burden you live with. I think all that you're trying to keep going, all the plates you got spinning, all the things you're stressed about and anxious about. Martha, I never meant for you to live that way. Remember when he said, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. Remember that? Don't worry about tomorrow. I'll just, let's just, let's just, in, right? Remember all that? And he looks at Martha. Maybe he looks at you, right? He says, wow, you got a lot going on. Maybe, Martha, you hear the voice of your mom saying, it's on you, Martha. It's on you. You better pull this off. Maybe you hear the parents as they handed the house to you. Maybe I don't, you got all kind of stuff in your head, Martha. I see right through that. What about you, right? What about me? How do we live? Wow, Jesus says, I never meant for you to live like that. That's not life to its fullest. I came to give you life. Not that. Martha, Martha, you're worried and upset about many things. I'm going to just stop here and let you think for just a minute. How'd you come in today? You see, unless you're free, you can't really let yourself go and worship God. Unless you're free, you can't really live the life that He planned. But, but we don't live free, do we? You know? You know? Martha. Martha. Oh, what a horrible way to live. You're worried and upset. 
How easily angered are you? Do you live on the edge enough that an unexpected event just sets you off? Martha, Martha, wow. Then, then he says, Mary has chosen what is needed. He said, in this situation, Martha, there's really only one thing that matters. And Mary picked it. And if you go back into the original language, and I won't bore you with a lot of that today, but if you go back in, he uses, the word he uses is the word we might use, the word buffet or smorgasbord or something like that. Here's, here's, what, here's what he says. He says, Martha, I came to your home today. And, and it's as if he uses the, the eating thing because Martha's probably freaked out about green beans at the moment. So Jesus understands where she's at. And he says, so, so Martha, I came to your house and I laid out this whole table of food, of dishes. Do you guys have like uh, meals together as a church, like potluck type stuff? I bet you do. You, you eat together sometimes? And people bring in food. Do you guys do that where people bring in food? And, 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 and he says, this is what has happened. You know when you go to those meals, you know that there's this particular person that's an awesome cook. And, 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 and she, it's usually a she, a, a couple of he's maybe, but she brings in this dish. It's like, I don't know, barbecue chicken with whatever. And it's always spectacular, right? So everybody who knows this gets in line. And to be polite, they put a little of this and a little of this, but they're saving room for the barbecue chicken. You with me? I was just in Texas the other day watching this happen at one of our churches. Apparently, I didn't know the dish. So that was a bummer for me, but apparently the church did. So we're all going through, and I see people leaving a big space, and then they get to this dish, and they, vroom, 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 you know? Like, I got no room on my plate. Who did, nobody told me that was the dish, right? Right? You know what I'm talking about, right? Well, this is what Jesus says. He says, I put out a bunch... But there's this one dish, Martha, and it's the best. It's the best. And what Mary did is she got up from her place, and she got her plate out, and she went to the best dish, and she just filled her plate. And she's over there eating. And you don't think that's, like, appropriate because she's, she's a woman and she should be somewhere else. And I disagree. I disagree, Martha. The Son of God is in your living room teaching, and you're worried about green beans boiling over. Something ain't right, but it's not right with you. Jesus Christ is in your living room teaching, and you're so caught up about green beans, you don't see it. Mary understands it, and I'm not going to go over to Mary and take that dish from her. No, 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 no. It's you that need to be straightened out. And Martha, you're so distracted. You're so focused on other things. By the way, good things, right? Serving in green beans are good things. And there is a time when the thing to do is to serve food. But it's not when Jesus is in your living room teaching, right? That ain't the time. This is the master who turned a few fish and a couple pieces of bread and fed thousands. He can handle dinner. You with me? This is not the time to worry about boiling green beans. Guys, gals, I, I don't want to reach the end of my life and have lived them for green beans, right? And it's so hard in this world to get caught up in that kind of stuff. Good things, even. You see, as Christians, as people who do our best to follow Christ, God helps us get strength and we get grace to get better and better at saying no to evil. Right? Are you getting better at that? Are you getting better at saying no to the bad in life, the things that are destroying you and destructive to you and your family? I hope so, because God helps us do that. And none of us are perfect or none of us have arrived, but boy, God helps us get better. So our enemy, so our enemy says, if I can't get them to do 
destructive things. I'll just distract them with secondarily good things. And they'll miss the best that God had dreamed for them. Martha has the Son of God in her living room. Oh, and she's, she's, she's stressing about green beans. I remember, uh, ah, this is going to get real personal, but this is when, this is when uh, I think this truth started to really hit home in my life. I was, uh, I'm, I'm the son of a pastor, so church has been a real regular part of my life for my whole life. I've done the religious thing my whole life. And I remember early on in my college life, I was a freshman in college, I remember a particular couple of days so vividly still. This day I would have done like I, I did every Sunday. I'd get up back in those days, churches did Sunday school. This is like 100 years ago, so if you're, if you're not old like I am, you, you might not remember this, but we'd, we'd get up we'd early, we'd do Sunday school, and I did that. I did a college-age Sunday school class, and we, we, uh, we, taught, we studied the Bible together, and I was actually one of the leaders that did some of the teaching in that particular class that particular morning, did that. Then we went to a worship service, just like what you've experienced here. Actually, it was an older white church, so it wasn't anything like you experienced here, but it was, it was church. It was church, okay? It was, it was church, and so we, we, we went to church, and so we did church, and we sang the appropriate hymns, and we listened to a teaching, and we did all the stuff, right? You, you know, at least know what I'm talking about. And then I remember that day, that Sunday, I actually went to a, a, another Bible study right after lunch on the college campus that I was attending, and I led the Bible study, and we were talking about reaching people for Christ, reaching our community for Christ. That was what we were talking about that time. And so we did that. I remember driving home from that Bible study. Now it's late in the afternoon, and it hits me. Shoot, I've got a test tomorrow morning, and I'm behind on studying for that test. Shoot, and, and you got to understand, a little bit of who I was in those days was considered to be a really good student, a really good student. So it was kind of my reputation, similar to Martha, a bit, I guess, as I think about it, a really good student. So I'm driving home, and I'm, I'm having this prayer. Now, maybe you've never prayed this way, and if so, don't raise your hand or admit it today, okay? But here's the way I was praying. God, I've been great today. <laughs> You ever said something kind of like that? <laughs> I've been to Sunday school, church, but I've been doing it today, right? But now I need some help back. Because, wow, big test. As if it's his fault that I haven't been studying all week, right? But, but I've been good today. Help you out, you know. Now you help me. I gave my tithe. I did my stuff. Okay. I know you've never prayed anything like that, but that was just me. Okay. So I'm having that prayer. And then I look down and I notice my gas gauge on my car is like on empty. Which, when I was in college, I was very poor and that's usually kind of, it, it stayed between empty and a quarter tank usually, you know. <laughs> so this wasn't unusual. So, oh shoot. So I've got to pull over. So I pull over, I start to fill my car up with gas. And this is a long time ago. Some of you remember how horrible it was back in these days. But credit cards had been invented, but you couldn't just swipe at the pump. Does anyone remember those way back days? Okay. <laughs> So that's where we were. And so pump the gas, put it back in, go in, and there's a line uh, in front of the cashier. So we're all waiting in line. I'm not paying attention. I'm thinking about my test. I'm praying the prayer I just mentioned. And then the place kind of clears out. I'm last in line. I get up to the counter, and the cashier around at the counter turns, turns around. Shoot. It's Donna. Uh, Donna and I had gone to high school together. And it was kind of awkward between Donna and I for a couple of reasons. One was, Donna was one of these folks that loved to talk a lot, <laughs> no matter the situation. So, you know, there's times, but there's also times. Okay, I better not. I won't come out looking really good in this story, so let's just accept that and give grace, okay? <laughs> but this is Donna. Also, also... Donna had asked me to the prom, and I had decided to watch a football game on TV instead. And she, uh, it's just awkward after that. You with me? Okay. So, oh no. 
Like, I'm never going to get home and, for my studying now. And so, but I'm polite, generally as a person, and I say, oh, hi, Donna, how are you doing? And you know sometimes when you ask that question, you're not looking for an actual answer, <laughs> right? You're, I mean, maybe you don't, but sometimes there's an appropriate response you're hoping for and you move on. But she, instead of that, says, oh, hi, Wes, I'm glad you came in tonight. Actually, my life is really, and I'm going to quote her exactly now, my life's really crappy. And she went on to tell me about a longtime boyfriend, uh, well, three or four months at least, at least sometime since high school, who had really treated her poorly that day and then dumped her afterwards and just shared a heartbreaking story. And honestly, and this isn't, this is where the story uh, this isn't funny at all. I wish, I wish in me at that moment would have been a heart that wasn't worried and upset, right, and stressed. And I wish I would have said, you know, wow, that's horrible and engaged with that. But instead, I'm just still thinking about my test. And I said some appropriate things. No, 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 now that I think... They weren't appropriate things. I said things that we sometimes as Christians say in those situations. I know all the right words to say, like I'll be praying for you. If I, if I really cared and really intended to make that a priority, that's one thing. But we don't always do that, right? I'll be praying for you. God will help you through this. I took the name of the Lord in vain right there. I'll get back to that later. And she ran my credit card through, gave me the receipt. I signed it. She continued to talk about her life. And I continued to say stuff. I remember saying one real stupid thing as I walked out. I said, there's more fish in the sea. You know, just stupid stuff we say to each other when we make comments, right? I walk out the door, jump in my car, rush home, study for the test, just cram for the test into the wee hours of the night, forget all about the conversation, get back to the school the next morning, take the test, don't remember anything about my results because as I'm walking out of the classroom, another high school uh, classmate of mine comes up and says, did you hear about Donna? And I said, no, and he said, she took her life last night. Yeah. Yeah. You know, God and I have had a lot of time now to talk about this and think through the way He intends for us to live our lives. And, and I, I got to tell you, when I sing about grace, I sing about that moment, other moments too, but that moment too, right? Because the fact that he would forgive a sinner like me is unbelievable. So I'm real grateful for his grace. I think about, yeah. I think about heaven and what that night must have been like for heaven. So... So we're in agreement, right, that God created Donna and loved her from before she was born. We, we agree that God loved Donna just unbelievably, right? We agree with that. And it was, it was so sad for God when she was born into a home that was far from him because that's not how God wanted Donna to grow up. And Donna went in and out of a few relationships with guys and, and tried to find love and acceptance that maybe your family didn't provide. And all along, God is, God is wanting to love her and, and show her how much he cares and how much he can fulfill her need to be accepted and loved. And he wanted to introduce himself to her in a real powerful way her whole life, but, but he never had an opportunity. There was never somebody that spoke into her life and introduced her to God. That just It never happened. Until one day, 
One day when a boyfriend mistreats her and dumps her, God sees an opportunity. God's, God's not going to force himself on anybody, right? He's a gentle inviter, and he sees an opportunity. He has a servant, a child, who went to Sunday school that morning, who his whole life has been serving God, who went to church and worshiped God and talked about how much his love matters and all this stuff, who went to Bible study and specifically taught a lesson on reaching people who don't know Jesus. So the plan, the plan was to take that person who already knew Donna, drain his gas tank, I don't know if he did it on purpose or not, but put him right there in the gas station. All he had to do was one thing, right? All he had to do was one thing. Yeah, he'd take a test the next day that years later he would remember didn't matter at all in his life. So at this moment, all he had to do was the one thing and life would change forever. And he'd get to be part of a life-changing story if he just did the one thing. So he puts him there, and then all of heaven waited to see if Donna would have the guts to say, when asked, how are you doing, if she'd have those rare guts to say, actually pretty crappy. Or would she just say, I'm doing fine, and move on. And all of heaven was coaching and hoping that she would say something real. And there must have been tremendous celebration in heaven when Donna said, no, I'm going to tell the truth. Wes, my life is crappy. There must have been such joy in heaven because this was the moment they'd been waiting for. This is a moment God had been waiting for Donna's whole life. But then, then this servant who was worried and upset about so many things, right? Just blew her off. We can't live this way, guys. The world needs Jesus. And if you get distracted about whatever, whatever, and you miss the point of your life, you'll reach the end and you'll have lived your whole life for some temporary thing. No. No. Don't let that happen, guys. Please. Please. You serve a God who's about really big things. And every moment of your life is about choosing the one thing. And through you, he's going to change people's worlds. Man, don't live your life for dream beats, please. Father in heaven, I'm, I'm going to pray for a moment. Sometimes I surprise people because I feel like God's always with us. And I, I, so I'm just going to pray. And I'd invite you to pray with me. Matter of fact, I think you have some ministers, some folks who come up and that you can pray with. And there's going to be some music and there's going to be some stuff start while I pray. And I don't know exactly all your traditions here, but would this be something you guys could, could pray with me about? I'd like to talk to God. He's right here with us. You believe that? He's like really sitting beside you. He's right there. And so you can pray there. You can come up and pray with somebody. There's going to be just a moment where we experience God's presence. And I I'd love to just talk to him with you. I don't claim to have figured this out. I just want to be with you. Father, Father, God, I'm, I'm sorry for the times that uh, I get caught up in conflict. I get caught up in the stuff of life. I, I get frustrated, annoyed, distracted, angered. And it's really green bean stuff, to be honest. Oh, God of heaven, don't let me live my life that way. You gave me a chance to live for bigger, better things and in the process to have a full, full life. Your yoke is easy. Your burden is light. I want to live the adventure of a lifetime that you picked out for me. Not live the stressed out, 
anxiety-ridden, conflict-laden life that I sometimes choose. I love you, and I want to live my life for you. And all these things that I struggle and strain for, you say, I'll get those in heaven. You're going to take care of me. Oh, God, oh, God, help us to be free. Help us to let go of all this junk and be free. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.